and the people on the on the stage dais i heard professor hargopal with rapt attention although i do not know telugu but his body language his feelings emotions and emphasis on different phrases which he used construction of language which he had was so convincing that i think i understood him fully one of the finest discourse on politics of education i have heard wonderful and after having heard him i started doubting the utility for me to speak after him listen to him there's no need for me to add anything but you given me this responsibility and you are being told that uh, it's very important for me to speak so i'm speaking but with not adequate conviction in what i'm going to say because i've heard for sir gopal he said everything which i want to say especially his emphasis on distinguishing between merit and non merit and just highlighting those that idea and the way he talked about social relationships and relationship with education these are the fundamentals of understanding what is wrong with our education system and how to rectify our education system i begin with a ancient story more than 2500 years old when near or what yeah i i begin with an ancient story maybe 26 20 more than 2500 years old when a one of the greatest teachers of the world was talking to a student and student was questioning his teacher the teacher's name was gautam buddha the student's name is ananda school is like you sitting there Ananda questioning his teacher, Gautam Buddha, expressing his uh, disenchantment for not having women joining the sanghas. They were male sanghas, purush sanghas, but not women sanghas. So he questioned his teacher. He said, "Why is it that you have not encouraged women sanghas? The sanghas were the organizations." where the message of buddhism was understood internalized analyzed and then taken to the masses it was a program of mass education mass political education against a caste system for equality for getting rid of discrimination from society it was a great political education program of those years so gautam buddha defended his stand for not including women he gave several reasons without reason he could not have convinced his student because reason was the very basis of discourse which buddha was promoting reasoning so he gave his reasons ananda was not convinced he kept on questioning insisting upon his question that why not women singha what you are saying is not convincing to me it's a great dialogue between the student and the teacher something which you are missing in our higher education system today missing in our degree colleges and our universities because nowadays things are much worse than they were earlier uh, since independence now if you raise too many questions you are charged with sedition deshdroha the moment you raise question you are called deshdrohi i am talking of the age age of buddhism when asking question was organic part of education debating issues was organic part of education as a result of this debate between ananda and gautam buddha eventually gautam buddha yielded and agreed okay we we'll open our our space for education for women also and women were invited to form women sanghas but even then the hegemony of patriarchy and i have just now heard the telugu word for patriarchy pitru swamya vyavastha is it correct Yes, Pitri Swamya Vyavastha or Pitri Aki Pitri Satta in Hindi. So the hegemony of Pitri Satta, hegemony is a very important concept. Professor Ajinder Singh also referred to the concept of hegemony, hegemony of idea, hegemony of philosophy, hegemony of language. All these are very important concepts in which we have to fight to uh, in our higher education system. Fight against hegemony, and there is an appropriate word in Telugu for hegemony. Makes sense to me also. Adipatham, adipatham is hegemony. This is what I'm talking about. The hegemony of Pitri Sakta, Petriaki was so powerful 
that although Gautam Buddha yielded to the idea of forming women's Sangha, he made a rule. The rule was the rules and regulations which will govern the functioning of the women's Sangha will be made by the male Sanghas. Male Sanghas will make rules and regulations for women's Sangha. Again, Ananda fought hard and got that rules and regulation also changed, transformed. And women's Sanghas flourished, blossomed very rapidly and they became the torchbearers of Buddhism all over the South Asian region, the Asian region, Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar, all over and finally to China also. This is how the battle between the two genders is at the very foundation of the spread of knowledge through Buddhism. This is the story I wanted to begin with. And this battle continued. You just heard Professor Arjan the same. Battle started between Ananda and Gautam Buddha continues when Kamala Soni, another student, goes to her teacher, Professor Sevi Raman, and says, I want to do PhD, I want to be in research, and Professor Sevi Raman becomes uncomfortable. What happened 2600 years ago? He repeated in the 1930s or 1940s. Once again, and it continues to repeat itself. It has been repeated. The gender hierarchy expressed through patriarchy it continues to reproduce itself as an education system goes ahead. We have not been able to demolish it. Before I go further, I am reminded and I must talk about their amazing paper written in 1916 by the young Dr. Medkar, who was still not doctor. He was working for his PhD at Columbia University in New York. And while a student, while writing his thesis, he wrote a paper for the anthropology seminar in Columbia University and that paper is called, is called The Caste in India. It's all a beautiful, powerful title, The Caste in India. It's a very small paper published like a little booklet, like many of his writings are available now in this in this format. So, read that paper, The Caste in India, where he establishes how the control on the marriage system is on the very basis of relationship between caste and patriarchy, how caste strengthens patriarchy and patriarchy in return strengthens caste. And from this he analyzes and concludes later on and much later after the paper was presented that if you want to destroy patriarchy, you have to fight against a caste system. You know, without, destroy, without destroying caste system, you cannot destroy patriarchy. He also formulated that castes are inherent in the upper caste. But the hegemony of the idea of patriarchy is so powerful that the hegemony of patriarchy filters down from the upper caste to the most oppressed lowest caste as well. And therefore, the oppressed caste also absorb patriarchy. And that this intricate relationship between caste system and patriarchy continues to be hegemonic even today. So all of you, were, I'm so happy to see so many women students and women scholars here. And this is unusual. Normally, you don't see so many women scholars in the gathering of this kind. But I'm sure the battle against patriarchy must have advanced in Telangana in order to enable so many women to come here. Otherwise, you would not have seen them in such proportion. The very is a, is a source of great happiness for me. Uh, I will um, refer to a interesting study made by a visiting professor from United States, from I think from Harvard University in 1990. His name is Professor Wiener. Professor Wiener was here for slightly more than a year. And methodically, he went on to interview different sections of society to know their idea about child labor. He focused on the why child labor exists in India in 1990 in such huge proportion. Me, I am not referring to his data, but the data very clearly show that out of 20 crore children which are in 6 to 14 year age group, no less than 5 to 6 crore continue to be child laborers even today. It has not changed. So, Professor Wiener was investigating why, why does child labor persist in such big proportion in India. And he went on to ask different leaders of different sections of society, advocates, politicians, 
NGO, NGO heads, religious, religious heads of various mathas in India and professors, scientists, social scientists. He went on interviewing a huge number of people asking only one question. Why does child labor persist in India? And our second question, are you comfortable with the idea of child labor or are you not comfortable? If you are not uncomfortable, why are you not uncomfortable? If two or three questions which are a central question, he went on asking. And everywhere he found, nobody was actually uncomfortable with the idea of child labor. Everybody had just adjusted. Many of the thinking people, intellectuals, political leaders, administrative officers, they all said, look, child labor has to be there because, because there is so much poverty in our country. And when there is poverty, Parents need the help of their children to earn money, to earn their livelihood. Therefore, there is nothing wrong in parents using their children for, for their own subsistence, for survival. So the question of survival became the foremost question. Therefore, child labor can be exploited by their own parents and by the society at large. It's amazing that Professor Wiener kept on asking himself, why are the people not uncomfortable? Finally, he writes in his book, a very well-known book called The State and the Child. Is translated into many languages of our country. So he writes in that book that I have finally come to the question which I am answering now, which he raised, why are people not uncomfortable with the idea of child? And he concludes, majority of the child labor, substantial majority of child labor come from the oppressed castes and classes. They are scheduled castes, they are tribals, they are Muslims, they are OBCs. That's the origin of, that's where they belong to. And because they come from oppressed caste, therefore it is understandable why the upper caste and upper classes who form the elite of India, the thinking elite of India, the intellectual elite of India, the administrative elite of India, the judicial elite of India, the political elite of India, they are the elites and they are they have adjusted because of the caste hegemony. They have no problem with the caste. Nobody is really bothered. They all think poverty is the reason and poverty cannot be banished. Therefore, we continue to adjust with child labor. We have, even today, we continue to adjust with child labor. They are not part of the school system. They may, they may be enrolled in the school registers by the school teachers because that is their duty to enroll when they are ordered every year in the beginning of academic year to make a complete enrollment of everybody living in that village or in that taluka headquarters or in the urban bastis, the everybody's name is written. And therefore, the gross enrollment ratio of India has never been less than 95%. Never been less. And from 1990 onwards, if you look at the statistics, you'll find our gross enrollment ratio is not less than 100%. It is a fallacy which people keep promoting and media is foremost in promoting, promoting the fallacy that after Right to Education Act 2009, the, the enrollment, enrollment ratio has become 100% because they don't read history. They only read the immediate news, news uh, releases from the government. Therefore, they do not know the history of enrollment. From 1990 onwards, gross enrollment ratio has been 100% or even plus 100%. I will not explain right now why it became plus 100%. But the reality is, it doesn't matter how many names you write on a register, they are not in the schools. Even if they are coming to the school, as people say they come to school for midday meal, even if they come to schools, I don't agree with it, that a child labor working in a remote part of the village will travel all the way to the school just to have a few morsels of food. It is 